everyone? Right now, cool. All right, excellent. Yeah, welcome to the 2021 Virtual Capital Climb. It is a beautiful day here on the Capitol steps. As you can see, we're out in the sunshine and it's just beautiful. So we're so glad you're here to help us bring awareness to perinatal mood and anxiety disorders and maternal mental health uh, to all parts of Michigan here this afternoon. I'm Barb Hawkins Palmer. I'm um, a Postpartum Support International, PSI, uh, board member for the Michigan chapter here. And I'm also the co-chair of the Kent County Healthy Kent Perinatal Mood and Anxiety Disorders Coalition. And I'm just really glad to be here and to be able to present our first speaker and um, all the other board members that are here to um, help with this agenda. So our first speaker is my friend and a colleague, and oftentimes we're called um, Kathy and Huda at our um, Hoda, <laughs> our coalition meetings. Um, I've known you for many years, and I think a lot of us here on this call have also known you in your 30 years of work in this area. She is the president of the newly established Michigan chapter for PSI and is a nurse for Spectrum Health here in Grand Rapids. And I just want to have you help me welcome Nancy Roberts. Hi, Nancy. Hi, thank you, Barb. What a nice Thanks welcome. I appreciate that. As you can see, our background shows the Capitol this morning. However, in reality, we're probably in our living rooms or offices. <laughs> so this is a virtual background and it's a picture that we took at one of our events several years ago when we were at the Capitol steps in person. Actually, we have held this annual event the first time in 2017, 18 and 19 on the steps. And of course, with COVID-19, last year was our first virtual e event, and then again this year. So hopefully we'll keep our fingers crossed. We can do this on the Capitol steps in 2022. So we're hopeful for that. So welcome everybody. It's so great to see you. And it would have been a beautiful day on the Capitol steps with the sunshine and the blue skies today. This is wonderful. Um, anyway, so I'm the chapter of the Postpartum Support International Michigan Chair. So um, we want to welcome you today and we're excited to be here with you for the next couple of hours. So we put together a really wonderful agenda with um, many speakers and I'm hopeful that you're going to find this very, very informative and interesting. So. Um, Anyway, a little bit about this picture also, as you can see in the corner here by my shoulder, you're gonna see a red and white quilt. And that quilt has been in attendance with us at the Capitol Steps and travels all over the United States and is um, showcased at various educational events surrounding perinatal mood and anxiety disorders. But I wanted to bring attention to this memory quilt because on this quilt are the names of 30 women who have died as a result of a perinatal mood and anxiety disorder. Um, it is um, owned by Postpartum Support International and also they have a blue and green quilt that also travels with us with us. So I wanted to bring attention to that quilt. Um, also, I wanted to bring attention to a couple of the shirts that you see us wearing today. I'm going to just kind of scroll down. And before we were um, a chapter state, we were, this coalition actually was formed back in 2014. And we were the Michigan Statewide Perinatal Mood Disorder Coalition for many years until one year ago when we transferred over to a chapter state for PSI. So we had shirts that we wore on the Capitol steps every year that matched the red color of the quilt. So we also have some of us with some gray shirts on today. So Sarah Doyle, Amy Lawson, you'll see the Capital Climb shirts, the Climb Out of Darkness shirts that we're wearing. So I wanted to just call attention to what we have on today, just to um, kind of combine the two events, the annual Capital Steps event 
with a climb out of darkness event. So that's a combination event today that we're really excited to be a part of. Um, I also wanted to um, highlight the proclamation that you saw on the screen just before we started this event. This proclamation um, was signed by our governor. Oh, there it is um, here in Michigan. And it is an annual proclamation that our um, health department pursues that uh, recognizes that May is every year Perinatal Wound Anxiety Disorder Awareness Month. So you'll see that as we kind of zoom in a little bit about um, all the different whereases and proclamations that we put forth. And um, this again has been signed by our governor. And this is probably year number, I wanna say eight or nine that we've gotten either a governor proclamation or a senator resolution proclaiming this month as um, Maternal Mental Health Month as well. So that's pretty exciting when we're finally awarded this. Um, and um, we wanna make sure that everyone is aware because this is one of the awareness activities that we do with PSI Michigan. It's awareness, it's all about education, whether it's community education or professional education. And we um, partake in hosting many educational events throughout the year. So that's one of the other goals and objectives that this um, group, PSI Michigan, um, does. We also award scholarships to people to attend um, postpartum support international trainings. So if you're interested in that, please let us know. Um, we have 13 board members that are with us today. Um, and we also work very hard amongst the 13 of us to host these kinds of events. So um, we're, we're like family. So if you're interested in any of a, um, a leadership position or interested in getting more involved, Amy's going to talk a little bit at the end of our day today about how to get involved. Um, just to mention also that we have five regional coalitions throughout Michigan, um, and they are all listed on our website. And we'll be putting some of our website addresses in the chat, but the one I'm referring to is www.psichapters.com backslash Michigan. And at that website, you're going to find information on the five um, PMD coalitions in Michigan. You're going to find um, out about the 13 listed support groups that we have in the state of Michigan. And you're gonna read a little bit about the nine state coordinators that we have spotted throughout Michigan so that if a mom or someone reaches out and needs some help, um, they can connect with a, a state coordinator who will then talk, text, phone, or email this person and get resources and inf information into his or her hands. So um, we do have a lot of uh, resources available. And as far as the state of Michigan, where are we when we compare ourselves to other areas throughout the US? And I find that because we've been meeting collectively um, and statewide for a number of years, we do have the benefit of being a little bit ahead of the curve. We do have resources and I just feel really fortunate that we're able to bring um, this information um, to families throughout Michigan. Um, moms and dads and grandmas reach out to us and you know we're able to reach out with professional education as well. So as far as the state of Michigan, I think we are ahead of the curve and I'm so grateful and thankful for that and the hard work that this particular um, PSI Michigan coalition has done over the years to put us in, in position to us in this way. So uh, let's see, I wanna make sure I didn't forget anything. I think we're good. Um, 
And we do have a couple of senators that have agreed to speak um, on our behalf. In the past, we've had Senator Winnie Brinks available from the Grand Rapids area that has um, actually stood at the podium um, when we were live on the steps and welcome um, the participants. And um, so we do have a couple of um, senators on call for today so that when they are available, we will go ahead and just transition right to those senators so they can make a statement and join us. So I think I'm going to go ahead and hand it back off to Barb. And um, she is our host for the day and our um, <laughs> mentor. And yeah, um, I'm holding Barb, up. <laughs> go ahead and have you um, just um, go you. ahead and lead us into the next presentation. Yeah. Thank, you, thank you, Nancy, for having me. Yeah, nice job. You know, really, when you think about the years and all that we've accomplished uh, growing this coalition to now be a Michigan chapter for PSI is very exciting. And I thank you for your leadership in that effort. Uh, she's done that in Kent County. Nancy, you're spreading across, I know, the state and also the nation with your expertise. And so again, we're just very fortunate to have you here in our state and you can't retire. Okay. <laughs> Next, we're, we're going to move on. Um, and again, wait for our uh, senators, if they are able to join us, we'll, we'll kind of fit them in. Uh, we're going to hear now about um, current legislation and the importance of having insurance coverage that extends, you know, for a year after birth. We have, um, again, current legislation happening and, um, and some personal stories that we want to share with you um, as we go along here. Um, first, we have um, Sarah Mertz and Amy Cole, who will be bringing us some information. Sarah Mertz is a nurse midwife and directs the POST project at Henry Ford West Bloomfield. Hi, Sarah. I see you there. Uh, she's a member of the American College of Nurse Midwives and currently serves as the chair of their perinatal mental health task force. Uh, Sarah is also a fellow board member of the PSI Michigan. Uh, joining Sarah today is Amy Cole from Mind the Gap Coalition, which includes PSI and the American College of Nurse Midwives, in addition to other national organizations that are committed to mental health uh, in childbearing women. She's also a member of the American College of Nurse Midwives and serves as their Director of Advocacy and Government Affairs. So I thank you both for being here at the Capitol Climb. Um, thank you so much. Um, I am uh, glad to be here with Amy today to talk to you about some um, government and advocacy issues surrounding maternal mental health. I think that we've made some uh, some big strides over the last several years in um, recognition that this is a situation and this is a condition that affects many women, one in seven approximately 900,000 women a year in this country. And I think that legislators, um, thanks to um, the work of people like all of us, um, everyone interested in this topic um, and who has experienced and survived uh, a mental illness that affected their pregnancy or postpartum um, have been speaking up and sharing their stories. And so I think that we have, um, have generated some interest and some awareness of what's going on. And we just wanted to share with you today some of the um, current um, legislation and uh, activities that are going on around perinatal mental health. Great. I Am I doing that now? Well, I believe um, Amy was gonna share some slides maybe or has some slides for us. Uh, okay. I you just joined us, so right. <laughs> <laughs> we can wait. Hey, hey, Amy. Hi. Sorry. Um, no, yeah. Great. <laughs> I have to see you. It's very. There they are. Those are the slides. <laughs> oh my goodness. I. I am um, sorry to show up like right as I'm supposed to speak, but it's. Thank you for having me. All good. Yeah. Um, so uh, 
Hello to everyone. Um, my name is Amy Cole. I am the Director of Advocacy and Government Affairs for the American College of Nurse Midwives. Um, I am located um, right outside of DC in Alexandria, Virginia, and I am in charge of um, basically implementing um, ACNM's advocacy and government affairs and policy priorities. Um, so today I was asked to come give an update on some of the things that we're focused on. Um, and I guess through the lens of, um, you know, equity and access um, to all things important in the maternal health and mental health space. Um, so that's what I'm going to do. I have a lot of slides. I'm realizing I don't have that much time. So I'm going to go through um, these pretty quickly and then leave, um, I guess, a, a couple of minutes for folks to ask me questions, um, you know, so that this can be an interactive um, presentation. Um, so next slide, please. All right, so here I've kind of outlined all of the things that the American College of Nurse Midwives um, is really focused on. Um, we, our board of directors, alongside our um, very robust volunteer structure and the national office staff um, are in charge for really ensuring that midwives and midwifery led care models have a seat at every table, um, are you know, fully integrated throughout our healthcare continuum. Um, and that midwives are able to work to you know, the full extent of their clinical training, their education, certification, um, and licensure. Um, so a state like Michigan is really great for um, midwifery practice, but um, we have a lot of work to do in several other states um, surrounding Michigan and throughout the US and a couple of things that we are trying to um, address at the federal level as well. Um, so the ACNM represents both certified nurse midwives for which there are roughly 13,000 and some change, and then a, another credential called the certified midwife, which is also um, an advanced practice uh, provider that has come to midwifery um, uh, not by way of nursing, but they are, um, you know, it could be someone like myself who um, was a political science, you know, major in college, and now I decide that I, I want to go and, you know, practice um, as a midwife or be a midwife. Um, I wouldn't necessarily have to go back to nursing school. I could um, go to, you know, I get my master's in midwifery, taking all the requisite courses, et cetera, et cetera. So um, we represent these two credentials, uh, certified midwives. There's only about 120 of them in the United States, um, but we are working to grow because as you all know, I'm sure that there is a, um, we are struggling uh, not just in the maternal health space, but you know, just in healthcare um, with an access to provider issue. And we know that um, midwives and the midwives that we represent are part of that solution um, to help improve access to care. Um, and you know, one of the things that we are, I would say the biggest thing that the ACNM is focused on is really growing capacity within the midwifery workforce. Um, so, Everything that we do is kind of from that lens. Um, you know, obviously, we have, as an organization, are really um, trying to address racism and inequities in the care continuum. Um, we know that a lot of um, the issues impacting um, people of color um, stem from racism, and we know that that's rampant throughout the healthcare system. So we have been very supportive of all manner of legislation at the state and federal level that looks to address this and come up with policy, policy solutions, um, you know, better integration of culturally competent and culturally congruent care. Um, and, and that's within the midwifery workforce as well. Um, full practice authority for midwives is a big issue, as I mentioned, uh, recognition of the CM credential because we know we want that to grow. Um, I'm gonna talk to you all a little bit um, in depth about the next few slides about our midwifery education and increasing funding in midwifery education, um, access to hospitals. 97% of midwifery attended births in this country occur in the hospital setting, but yet midwives don't, um, aren't a lot of times able 
to admit their patients without having to turn them over to a physician, um, access to clinical sites. Um, I want to throw in here just the ability to, <laughs> you know, ensure that all women and birthing people have access to the full panoply of um, healthcare services, including mental health services. Um, that is also, you know, something that we approach in all of our meetings, all of our discussions about, you know, midwives and what we are able to do, what our members are able to do, but then ensuring that people have access um, because it shouldn't be people that look like me um, only, you know, able to find a mental health uh, therapist and others not so much. So a um, lot of stuff on this slide, Equi you know, equity as we're looking at reimbursement, um, being able to be paid, um, you know, to, for doing the job, you know, <laughs> equitably paid, reimbursed, I should say. Uh, many states do not, um, you know, pay. We know that over 50% of the births in this country are reimbursed under Medicare or under Medicaid. And that we, and we also know that um, the physician fee schedule under Medicaid is terrible, um, but yet there are 15 states where midwives are paid less than 100% of an already terrible um, reimbursement structure. And we know that this is also happening in private private payers as well and third, other third party payers. So we are focused on that equity and reimbursement for doing the jobs we were educated to do. Um, and then obviously access to midwives and midwifery lived care models, and then really um, a focus on reproductive justice issues and ensuring that um, women and birthing people have access to, you know, the full range of comprehensive sexual and reproductive health care services. Um, next. Yep. So this is um, just a quick uh, snapshot of, um, we like to use this, this is this uh, visual really resonates um, at both the state and federal level. So you know, Michigan is a yellow state, um, you know, Wisconsin, a lot of the states around you, we've got work to do, um, not as bad as um, the red states, but this is something that we use to, st to state shame, like I say, on Capitol Hill. Um, depending on who we're meeting with, you know, it always comes back, all politics are local. And even when we're talking about things on Capitol Hill in DC um, with the leg federal legislators, um, the number one question, and usually the first question I get is, well, what is the state of play back home in my district, in my state? Um, so we like to show this and a lot of folks, there's been a lot of momentum um, building um, over the past couple of years, you know, people are talking about midwifery and midwives um, where, you know, they weren't, it was sort of like a fat, I, you know, I say a fad where I am before, or like not as many, but now we have a seat at the table. People are talking about how great it is and all of the, you know, showing the research and the evidence and the data. Um, and so people like to know, well, what's going on in my state? And I'd say, well, you know, midwives are restricted and they cannot practice without having to jump through these arbitrary hoops. Um, so this is a visual that we use for all of our advocacy efforts at both the state and federal level. Um, next slide, please. All right, so I'm gonna quickly go through a couple of recent wins for midwifery and maternal health. Next slide, thank you. Um, so at the close of last year, and, and you all may or may not know, the um, previous Congress, the 116th session of Congress was just, it wasn't a very um, good year for a, a lot of great maternal health related legislation that had been introduced over the course of 2019 and 2020. Um, not a lot of movement. And a lot of that is because, you know, we were, you know, and still amid a global pandemic and all of 2020 was really focused on um, addressing issues around COVID, um, which, you know, maternal health, it was an issue within COVID as well, but all of the great bills, the Black Maternal Health Momnibus, the Midwives for Moms Act, all of these um, wonderful pieces of legislation that had been introduced kind of you know, hit a wall and didn't go anywhere. So there weren't many wins, I should say, for maternal health care during last Congress, but within the budget bill that was passed um, at the end of, right after the holidays, the end of the year, there were a couple of things that uh, were really good for increasing access to midwives and midwifery led care programs. Um, and that, we, could yeah. you briefly, for people who don't know what the Mom and the Bus Act is and where it is, could you Sure, sure. Describe that, please, because I think that's really important in the context of this 
Yes, yes. So, yeah. And I, yeah. So the um, Black Maternal Health Momnibus is a um, a big portfolio of amazing legislation that is really looking to fill the gaps. And actually, I have a slide. You know what? Oh, okay. Sorry. Yeah, I didn't yeah, mean let me that. You know what? That's Sarah. This that's perfect because I don't know how much I. I think that's where we want to focus. Um, and then I'll. This come is back. good. Yeah. Um, okay. So. All right, so I'll talk about midwives for moms, and then I'll talk about the Black Maternal Health Momnibus. I won't give you guys, you all, the back and forth of what happened last year. Let's talk about what's happening right now. Um, new Congress, new administration, lots of momentum building on years of research and data um, around midwifery-led care, midwives, access, um, and also a... Um, uh, maternal health crisis in this country that disproportionately impacts um, people of color. So through that lens, ACNM is like, well, what can we do? What is our part? Um, the Midwives for Maximizing Optimal Maternity Services Act um, is a bill that is going to be introduced, reintroduced next Wednesday um, in both the House and the Senate. And essentially what this does is we know that we need to increase capacity to the full range of maternal health care providers in this country. Midwives have a role to play, but we are small but mighty. So we need to grow our workforce um, so that we can provide that full range of services that, that people need. And so uh, we have pulled together legislation that is going to be reintroduced. It was introduced last, last uh, Congress, did not pass, um, but essentially what this would do, it would, it would um, establish a designated funding stream under Title VII and Title VIII of the Public Health Service Act for accredited midwifery education programs. So these are programs that educate and that are recognized by the Department of Education, but that educate certified professional midwives, certified midwives and certified nurse midwives. And there is, um, it's going to be a grant program established under the Department of Health and Human Services, Health Resources and Services Administration, by which programs, midwifery programs will apply for grant funding and they're going to need to demonstrate through the application process that if they are awarded funding, so there's gonna be 30 million under Title VIII for certified nurse midwives in schools that reside within, um, midwifery programs that reside within schools of nursing, and then 25 million under Title VII for programs that reside outside of schools of nursing and programs that educate certified professional midwives, a different type of midwife that ACNM does not represent, but we work closely with. Um, through the grant process, they're going to have to demonstrate that if they are awarded the funding, um, because one of the big things is that we need to increase you know, access to culturally congruent care in this country. Um, we know the midwifery workforce does not look like the people that we take care of. And so what are we going to do about that? So funding was going to be given to programs that say, you know what, this is how I plan to ethnically and racially diversify my student body and faculty. Funding will also be used, um, can also be used to help um, provide a stipend for preceptors. Um, another thing that funding can be used for is programs. We are focused at ACNM at really trying to get, get working with our accrediting body to get programs established at historically black universities, colleges, um, and other institutions. So funding could be used for that. And so all of this is around midwives have a role to play, the evidence and the data shows we need to diversify the workforce. We've established this grant program. It's really important that this legislation passes because if it does, we'll be able to grow our numbers. Um, so this is being reintroduced uh, in the House next Wednesday. And now we have got a companion bill in the Senate, which we did not have before. That is going to be really amazing. And ACNM is going to push a lot of information out about that. Okay. And I think with regards to mental health services, Yep. Um, you know, midwives are prescribers, right? Yep. And as our programs become um, become um, more well-rounded in midwifery and we teach more about um, maternal mental health, which is the second um, leading cause of death in our pregnant and postpartum women and the number one comorbidity, meaning if you come to, um, if you become pregnant, 
than, you know, the, of any other disease that you may already have, asthma, diabetes, anything like that, you're most likely to have anxiety or depression or a history of anxiety or depression. And so as midwives and OB doctors, we need to appreciate that um, we need a lot of information. We need a lot of education around how to um, incorporate that in your OB care and in your postpartum care. And so, you know, being able to do that through the midwifery programs and expand um, access to care to both OBs and midwives means that um, if uh, women and childbearing people are experiencing anxiety or depression that requires, um, that requires um, management with medication, we need prescribers to do that. And as we know, there's you know, a shortage of psychiatrists that are able to do that. So we really need family practice um, physicians and nurse practitioners, OBs and nurse midwives who you know, specialize in spending a lot of time face-to-face -face with our patients and so forth to be able to manage and offer those services. Um, um, being able to prescribe antidepressants if that's necessary in a person's recovery, for example. So part of the importance of, of improving maternal mental health services is being able to um, increase a workforce that's able to uh, take care of, of our people when they are struggling with these issues. Right, no, thank you for making that connection. And I think I probably should have started off by saying that the ability for the members in the profession, well, you know, the CNMs and CMs we represent to practice full scope midwifery care, which includes all of those things um, and ensuring that we do have a workforce so that people can be deployed into low resource rural and underserved areas to provide this critical care, which includes the maternal mental health Full access to maternal mental health services. Thank you, Sarah. Um, so that's why we're focused on growing capacity within our workforce, in addition to having midwives be able to practice um, the way that, you know, they were trained and educated to do. Um, next slide, please. And then I won't spend too much. This is just another, the baby, this is another critical piece of legislation that we've been focused, and this builds upon um, some CMS data around um, how access um, to prenatal postpartum labor and delivery services that have been, um, that occur in the birth, birth center setting um, are great, and we need to expand upon that. And, you know, midwives are a great resource. Um, the evidence shows this, you know, high quality, um, low cost. And so this is a piece of legislation that would build upon um, a demonstration project um, by establishing a grant program in six states under the Medicaid program. So more to come on that. Um, next slide, please. Uh, the Black Maternal Health Momnibus. Um, this is also, I talked about this very briefly, um, but this is basically evidence-based. It's a group of 12 bills that um, what, what was done was the House Black Maternal Health Caucus took a look at, and so it, that's full of 100 plus members um, in the House, took a look at all of the barriers that remain and all of the things as it relates to maternal health um, that had not already been addressed in legislation. And basically this legislation is filling the gaps through the lens of we need to do something about um, the state of maternal health and the impact it's having on um, black women and birthing people and communities of color. Um, so this is, I, I won't go through, I can share lots of information for folks. I think um, one of the big things here that we have been working with um, Representative Lauren Underwood and Alma Adams, they're the co-founders of the Black Maternal Health Caucus um, because it, it works, it's complementary to the midwives for moms so that building capacity in the perinatal workforce um, there is a great bill called the Perinatal Workforce Act that we are working um, to elevate and push alongside the midwives for moms because this basically takes everyone else in the perinatal workforce, physicians, nurse practitioners, doulas, and establishes a grant program for diversifying the entire workforce. While midwives for moms is just looking at the midwives, the Perinatal Workforce Act is looking at everyone else. And um, there's also legislation that um, would create grant programs for uh, medical schools, nursing schools, schools of public health to um, 
you know, be awarded a grant to incorporate implicit bias training into their curriculum, um, mental health into their curriculum. Um, but this is something that we are very um, supportive of, um, as is pretty much everyone in the maternal health um, stakeholder community. Um, it's a very, um, it's a very partisan, it shouldn't be a partisan issue. Maternal health should not be a partisan issue, but as everything is in Congress, it's, I mean, it's everyone has a mom or is a mom. That's what we like to say. So this should be something like a no brainer. Um, I, but it's not, it's complicated. <laughs> I don't know why, but there are several pieces of legislation within the um, Momnibus that are bipartisan on are likely to pass this Congress. And so we have been in the Perinatal Workforce Act is one of them. So we have been, you know, we, we've got a great campaign going um, and really encouraging our members to um, engage and help support and engage at the state and federal level on this very important issue. Um, the postpartum support international is also very supportive right. of Momnibus and yeah. Momnibus. Um, some of the key factors um, included in maternal health is um, is determining what uh, um, what are um, barriers to receiving behavioral health and mental health care services for women. Um, so they that's one of the key factors that's included in the Momnibus legislation is surrounding behavioral and mental health services. Right, and and looking how racism impacts, you know, the social determinants of health. I mean, that yes, there's there's it is um it's fantastic. So if you want more information, the ACNM has a campaign set up. And I'm happy to share this with Sarah so she can share with with all of you um to learn more about all of the individual bills and how maternal mental health is weaved into pretty much <laughs> everything in with in that momnibus. Um, next slide. See. Um, the MAMA Act is an, another great bill that we have been um, uh, supporting. Um, this would authorize federal funding for the Alliance for Innovation on Maternal Health Care grant program. And these are the bundles that hospitals are encouraged to implement, um, to look at things. At, I mean, I think mental health is one of the bundles that folks mm -hmm. have been looking at. <laughs> um, opioid use, um, uh, hemorrhages. And so that this is this is a great, this would ensure that the federal government um, authorizes funding during the budget process annually for AIM. Um, so ACNM is very involved with the AIM program that one of the original conveners alongside ACOG. Um, so we've been very supportive of this and also expanding. So the big one here is, um, I, I kind of moved through it really quickly, but the American Rescue Plan, uh, which passed earlier this year, did include an expansion of, um, it's for a period of five years with a demonstration program, if you will, of um, Medicaid services from 60 days postpartum to a full year postpartum. Um, and now this is still an option for states, but and this includes, so if you are a state that decides to do this, you've got to include all, all, all the full range of services, which includes maternal mental health services. Um, the MAMA Act takes it a step further, and this would require, so rather than it be an option, it would be something that states have to do. So let's move from the 60 days, you know, you have to do for this whole year postpartum. So um, it is a what happened with the American Rescue Plan is a step in the right direction. It doesn't go far enough. And I think everyone in the maternal health stakeholder community, including PSI, um, I know the, we're all part, I'm sure you all have talked about this. We're part of this great coalition called Mind the Gap. Um, we have, as a coalition, weighed in with MACPAC. That is the body that advises Congress on changes that need to be made to the Medicaid program. Um, you know, several studies, lots of research, everyone agrees this needs to be something that is extended, mandatory, states must for a year, but there's a cost associated with it um, and therein lies the issue. Um, but we're still gonna continue to beat the drum. There are several pieces of, including within the Momnibus that I just talked about, there's a provision. It seems like everyone has a provision about expanding, making it mandatory that Medicaid, that states expand coverage and provide access to that full range of full spectrum of care. Um, so this is, um, and then again, the, you know, grant programs for investing in implicit bias and cultural competency training. We know that people do better with providers that look like them. Um, so that is also something that you will see um, in several pieces of legislation that are out there in the maternal health space. 
Um, next slide, please. I think I might be. Um, Rural Moms Act is an, another um, bill that we have been super supportive of as well. Like I said, these are all being reintroduced this Congress. Um, this would establish um, a new uh, rural maternal health and obstetric care training demonstration project um, that would include um, nurse practitioners, nurse midwives, doulas, obstetricians, gynecologists, um, women's health nurse practitioners, you know, really everyone in that maternal health space um, and looking at um, training for these people, um, pre prenatal, postpartum, all of the, all of the training, including maternal mental health services um, in little cohorts out in rural America. So this is another demonstration program. So basically this is like, Congress likes to do this where they're like, let's do a demonstration program, even though we have the data to show that this needs to be done and we must do it, but they need to have, you know, they want their own data. So this is another piece of legislation that um, would help expand services, would help address equity um, across the board for all, all people looking for prenatal, postpartum, labor and delivery, all of the services involved during that, the reproductive years. Um, and so we've been super supportive of that. And we also have another campaign on our site, um, you know, engaging our members to help engage members of Congress, share the word with consumers, their clients, all of the things. Um, and then I think the big one here is building off of a lot of the waivers that were put in place at both the state and federal level around telehealth services, especially during COVID-19. Um, they wanna explore like, what, does, what would that look like um, to make permanent? Um, Cause I know a lot, a lot of folks have a lot of groups, health groups have done this, a lot of states have done this, but let's look at making this permanent for something like under the Medicaid program. So people could um, access these services, both prenatal and postpartum services through telehealth networks. Um, so, and that would include maternal mental health services as well. Um, so a lot of good bills, um, a lot of momentum, a lot of bipartisanship on some of these, and we are feeling, um, very hopeful that there will be some success in this space, this Congress. Um, like I said, you know, they almost have to make up for not doing very much last Congress, um, unfortunately. And then a lot of this stuff you will see too at the state level, um, a lot of states are, so California, for instance, has their own version of a Black Maternal Health Mommy Bus. And I know that there are other several states that are looking at that as well. So. California, I point to because they, you know, a lot of what California does kind of, you know, creates policy federally. So they um, recognize the need and are doing it on their own. They're not even going to wait for the federal government or, you know, for Congress to pass it. So I expect to see more of that in the coming um, legislative sessions as well. Um, I think that, and then barriers to mid, like midwifery care, I, I kind of led with this. This is really ensuring that people understand what we do as providers and that we are primary care providers for women throughout the lifespan. It's not just pigeonholed to, you know, birth, um, prenatal and postpartum services, but, you know, we are a recognized provider under the Medicare program. And I mean, I'd like to take this when we're talking about mental health services, like, you know, it's like baby steps. Let's start with maternal mental health, but really ensuring that everyone has access to these critical services throughout their lifespan. Um, you know, but we'll get there. Uh, but we at ACNM are looking at the things that prevent our members from being able to, um, you know, work to the top of their scope, um, provide, you know, prescriptions. I mean, all of the things. So through that lens, these are some of the things that we're focused on under the Medicare program currently that are still barriers to um, midwifery care. Um, like I'll point this one thing out just so folks can understand what I'm talking about. Um, there is quite a large um, disabled population of women of reproductive, women and birthing people of reproductive age under Medicare. And um, as it stands right now, a midwife cannot um, write a script for a breast pump um, because Medicare says that they cannot. Um, and we're trying to fix that because we also know that has downstreams. A lot, of, a lot of state Medicaid programs look to what Medicare does. And we know that this has been an issue with several states. I'm not sure if it's an issue for Michigan or not. Mm -hmm. um, but yes. Is it? Okay, well, yes. Yeah. So that's something that we're trying to fix federally so that there's a model so we can say, look states, you know, here. 
Um, so that's really, I know I kind of w went through this really quickly. Um, if do folks have questions? Um, there's, there's a lot, there's a lot, go there's a lot going on. Yeah, there really is, Amy. That was um, just a lot to take in. I appreciate your time and uh, all that you've shared here. Uh, it's just been very helpful to us in our advocacy work in Michigan. I feel like we're ready to take on some things. So very, very um, helpful. Okay. Are there any questions in chat? If you have them, put them there. I'm going to um, move us just to get to our point, but we may come back. So don't leave. <laughs> if, you, if you can stay, that'd be great. Um, I'd like to uh, introduce our next presenters that are with us today. Um, and also welcome in our Facebook audience. I had not mentioned that we're streaming on Facebook uh, live today. So we're very, very excited to have you all joining us on that um, platform as well. So um, our next speakers are Carrie Kohlhouse and Kira Baskin, who will be sharing the experience of losing healthcare coverage. Some of the things that Amy was talking about, I think um, will uh, play out in some of our next presenters. Uh, Carrie is the executive director of Moms Bloom, which is an organization that provides in-home postpartum support to families with newborn babies. And also with Carrie is Kiera Baskin. Hey, Kiera. Uh, she is the program manager for the Day One Doula program here in Kent County, uh, a new program to train doulas of color. Very excited uh, that you both are here. Uh, she's also the owner, I forgot this, of Birth to Bump to Birth Doula Services. So awesome for you both to be here. Thank you. Thanks, Barb. And uh, thanks so much to um, PSI for, for inviting us to speak. Um, as Barb mentioned, my name is Carrie Kohlhaus and I'm executive director for Moms Bloom. It's an organization that provides postpartum support to women and families in need. And we do that by recruiting and training volunteers, just people from the community. And we match them with families who really need extra hands at home during those first few very difficult weeks and months after bringing a baby home. I know how exhausting and isolating and overwhelming that time can be and how demanding it can be to care for a newborn baby while your body's still recovering. That's why I'm so passionate about getting mothers the help that they need so that they can form loving bonds with their babies, allow their bodies to recover, stay mentally, emotionally, and physically healthy, and go on to thrive in their roles as mothers. I'm really honored to be leading this organization and I'm now the mother of two children, an almost 12 year old son and a four year old daughter who I'm now able to care for and provide for abundantly. But this was not always the position that I was in. When I had my son about 12 years ago, I was in a very different position. I was waiting tables and trying to get through college and I got pregnant. Unfortunately, I did not have health insurance that covered pregnancy. But fortunately, I did qualify for Medicaid. So I was able to keep myself really healthy during my pregnancy. I went to all my doctor's appointments. I took my prenatal vitamins. I ate well. I exercised every day in between classes. I was really committed to staying healthy and having a healthy baby. I felt very well supported by my doctor and the team at her office. On my final visit to the doctor before I gave birth, I remember my doctor saying, hey, you need to schedule your six-week postpartum follow-up visit and you need to keep that appointment. Don't you dare reschedule it because you're probably going to get dropped from Medicaid shortly after you give birth. I was sort of taken aback and I said, oh, I didn't know that that was a thing. Um, will my son still qualify for coverage? And she said, yes, your baby will still qualify, but once the baby's out of you, you'll more than likely to get dropped because you won't qualify anymore. So I did make it to that six week appointment and I remember feeling physically and emotionally exhausted. Having a newborn was so much harder than I expected. It felt like the whole world had been keeping a big secret from me about how challenging this whole thing was. And looking back now, I see that postpartum depression was creeping in. But at six weeks, I was still confusing it with sleep deprivation and the very real difficulty that nearly every parent experiences. So at that visit, I was most concerned with just discussing my physical recovery and breastfeeding. But shortly after that, things got dramatically worse. I fell into a very dark place that included a lot of intrusive thoughts that were really scary to me. Horrible thoughts about hurting myself and hurting my baby. I felt so ashamed and scared about these thoughts that I didn't share about them with any of my friends or family. I thought maybe I was just a terrible person 
and I was a failure as a mom and I needed to just work harder at it. I now know that this is really common and that most, mom report, most moms report symptoms being the worst, most intense right around eight weeks, which is right when they might be losing their coverage. Then one day a stranger knocked on my door. She was a volunteer with a local breastfeeding advocacy group and she was there to help me succeed at feeding my son. Now, because she was a stranger, not in spite of the fact that she was a stranger, but because she was a stranger, I told her the truth. When she asked, so how are things going? I said, not well. I feel like I'm failing as a mother. I feel angry and sad and hopeless all the time. I'm scared of my own thoughts. And she said, I'm not a doctor, but it sounds to me like you're suffering from postpartum depression and you should call your doctor. The next day at work, the memory of what I had said to her and what she had said to me was kind of reeling through my mind. And I hid in the stairwell so that no one could hear. And I called the doctor and said I needed to be seen that I thought I had postpartum depression. I didn't have health insurance or the money for that doctor's visit or for any treatment or medication, but I put it on a credit card. I had realized after my conversation with the stranger that I couldn't ignore this, it was too dangerous. I have thought back to this situation a lot over the last 12 years. I have wondered, what if the stranger never showed up? What if she hadn't known what to say? What if she'd reacted differently? What if I wasn't a white woman? What if she had labeled me as just another single mom? What if I hadn't been about to graduate college and confident I could soon pay off debts? What if I didn't have a credit card or didn't qualify for one? I now know that as many as one in five women will have a perinatal mood or anxiety disorder, which makes it the most common complication after childbirth. And with more than 100,000 births taking place in Michigan each year, that means as many as 20,000 women right here in Michigan will experience a mental health disorder like I did. And with 41% of Michigan's babies born into homes below the poverty line, how many of their mothers will be in a situation as privileged as mine? That's why I'm here today to ask Michigan's leadership to pass legislation to ensure that moms can stay on Medicaid in our state for at least one year after giving birth so that she has the means to stay physically and mentally healthy and be well enough to truly provide quality care for her baby. The life and health of a mother is not only important when there is a baby inside of her. And with startling maternal mortality rates after birth, we need to take action to ensure that mothers survive and thrive. We have to do better. As a society, we need to value and support mothers as much as we value and support babies. You simply can't do one without the other. And now I wanna to go to Kiara Baskin, who I'm honored to have on our Moms Bloom board. Um, she's been doing great work for many years on the ground with mothers, and she has a lot of great information to share with us about mothers who have been impacted by this lack of coverage. Thank you so much, Jade. And thank you all for joining today and for really bringing awareness in pursuit of access, equity, and outreach. As a doula and community connector, I've seen firsthand the gaps that exist for mothers that pour over into the urban. No other part of our healthcare system has a greater effect on the health of our population than maternity care. When we look at the current state of maternity care, we can do better and we must do better. Women in the United States are the most likely to die from complications related to pregnancy or childbirth. Black women, however, are significantly more likely to have severe maternal morbi morbidity, SMM, or a near miss. These events can have long-term consequences to a woman's health. High blood pressure, infections from a cesarean section, and blood clots are some of the top contributors of severe maternal morbidity. These events increase the likeliness of rehospitalization during the postpartum period and what I've personally witnessed is over 50% of the pregnant women who've come under my care have experienced month to month changes in insurance. And I saw the same women become uninsured at various points within six months following birth. There is an adjustment period after one delivers a baby. And I always prep my clients on what's to be expected and how to alleviate stress. However, I still haven't quite found the best way to tell a mother that she may lose her healthcare coverage just 60 days after the birth of her baby. Many days, I found myself sitting alongside these mothers on the computer, 
or on extensive holds with customer service, doing whatever we could to make sure that coverage wasn't lost. Our mothers are really our first homes and we must take care of them. Coverage can literally mean life or death. We continue to see maternal deaths during the postpartum period. Permanently extending coverage beyond 60 days postpartum in Michigan is a direct response and correlation to improved outcomes and reduction in disparities. We can't wait to move on this. The future of our community depends on women having access to the support services they need. Healthy mom and healthy baby is just the bare minimum when we think about maternal infant health. We really have the opportunity now to re-envision what the infrastructure is that's needed to truly center women and all birthing people in the work that we do. We must make this a priority. We must continue to elevate the voices and needs of those who historically haven't had a voice. We've waited far too long for this moment, but the time is now. And I'm really hopeful and excited to see the transformation and support of assuring better futures for our community and for all. Thank you. Yeah, wow. Thank you both. That was pretty powerful. Um, you know, the needs that we have that some law would help make a difference, wouldn't it? Just to extend our uh, medical coverage for pregnant women, or I guess postpartum women is, I think, really critical. And we've had some efforts for COVID. Is that right, Carrie? Where um, was it? Senator Brinks has introduced some legislation. Could you talk about that? Sure. So right now in Michigan, um, Medicaid coverage does extend for one year, but it's due to temporary legislation um, as, a, as a result of COVID-19. Um, so the Senate Bill 252 that Senator Brinks has introduced would permanently extend um, Medicaid coverage to one year postpartum and ensure that once the, the federal legislation expires, that we would always provide that support here in Michigan. I would want us to know, how do we um, address that? Is that something we would write to our local legislators? Is there a, maybe a number we could put in the chat box for which bill it is? Because I believe she is going to be, re she already has reintroduced it. Okay. She has, and she's gonna be talking about it on the Senate floor today, um, along with PMAD awareness, So, um, which is great. So um, yeah, I'll, I'll put some information in the chat about the bill and about what folks can do to help support it. Oh, I think that would be great. Just great. I hope you'll read the chat. There's a comment um, from Lindsay Capel. Our mothers are our first homes and we must take care of them. I love that quote too. Lindsay, I wrote it down thinking, you know, mothers are our first home, uh, very powerful. Thank you again for sharing your stories and you're so on target on the what ifs. Uh, talking about your privilege, Carrie, uh, it probably would have been a different story, you know, if you didn't have some of the assets that you have, mm -hmm. that you have. Are there any further questions or comments from our audience? We'd like to have them while we have these excellent experts, same with Sarah and Amy are still with us as well. So we invite you to ask any questions. Will there be a summary of the information shared um, with legislators? Um, I, I think what you all are sharing is so important. You know, that's a great idea. Um, maybe that's something the board members could consider, you know, as a follow-up, uh, we're going to do some debriefing, you know, that that would be a, a great idea to help with, again, this legislative bills that are, are federal level and then also our state level that we, we can have an impact, I really believe, with as many members as we have as part of our friends of PMAD and also the chapter here in Michigan. I think we can have a strong voice Excellent. Excellent. Well, we thank you all once again for being here, sharing your stories, your personal experiences. It helps us to understand and how we can make some changes lasting through policy and changes in our, in our laws. Thank you again. We are going to move on. Uh, we have, um, this is probably one of my favorite parts of the climb is our PMAD survivor panel. 
uh, to you know, hear from those who have actually been impacted by perinatal depression and anxiety and learning from them what they've been able to do to be resilient and to uh, get through and to manage their um, depression anxiety. So I'd like to introduce my fellow board member, uh, Kirsten Kimmerly, who will be moderating our panel of experts here. And she'll be introducing our, our moms and getting us set off for um, this next part. Welcome, Kirsten. Thank you, thank you. Um, I'm Kirsten Kimmerly, as Barb mentioned. I um, am actually very near to the Capitol. Um, I'm from the capital city here. I am a Lansing area. My office is actually in East Lansing, um, women and children's therapist. Um, and we have, I think, five women that are going to join us today. And I guess I'm not exactly sure if they're all here because of how the view is. So let me see if I can take a look on the side here. Um, five different women that I see Sasha is here and I see Mariah and Amanda and I think we've got a Melissa and a Chelsea somewhere out there. Um, so we've got several local women. And then um, I know one of our women is also from the Bronson area. Um, and I represent those moms, like some of you may be, that I have a nine-year-old that I found out I could not do third grade math during the pandemic. I had to tap out on my math knowledge as early as third grade. So for those of you who are also working and teaching from home, um, that that is another set of stuff that we definitely understand. So this entire time I've been um, working during the pandemic with families and children and mothers and parents in general, talking about how to get through this time. Um, so I'm really glad to be here with you and I'm super excited so for you to meet the women. Um, I think what we'll do is have each of you introduce yourself, tell a little bit about who you are, who your kiddos are, what you've been through, if you have some successes or some things that were challenging. Um, if anybody has questions, feel free to put those in the chat. And I do our local support group here every week. And so we'll kind of run it a little like that, kind of just a casual, informal conversation. Um, so welcome, everyone. And let's see, it looks like... Not sure who we want to go first. Maybe Amanda, I see you pop up for me. Are you up for that? Okay. Yep, that's all right. There we go. I got it unmuted. <laughs> I It's super exciting for me. Some of you I haven't seen in a while. So hi, Amanda. I'm excited. Hello. To see you. <laughs> Yes, um, I'm Amanda. I'm a mom of two. I have a five-year-old and a two-year-old. Both are very busy. Um, it was after my first kiddo that I first experienced um, postpartum anxiety. Um, and then my second kiddo came along. I was kind of prepared. I had found our wonderful little support group in Lansing um, and, you know, had definitely a lot of tools, but I ended up having postpartum depression, ended up going on medication, um, and for me, knowing ahead of time and having found that support group was huge, um, walking into it and recognizing what was going on with me, not just having, you know, the doctors tell me, well, you know, you're high, scoring high. I had more support <laughs> going in. So it was very nice. Um, with my youngest, she was actually born in 2019. Um, so she's turned <laughs> her first birthday was the week, I think was the day actually they did the emergency declaration for the pandemic. So <laughs> Um, she's a very much so a pandemic baby. Um, I went through that first year, uh, significant postpartum depression. And then, um, when we got the pandemic, so it was, it's definitely been a wild ride. <laughs> um, therapy, knowing what my supports are has been very helpful for me, um, and getting through this. So we've been at home a lot together, <laughs> been a lot of togetherness. So, um, yeah, anything else? Amanda, you have a, um, another unique piece that if I could share, I think you, um, are, have you also been working during this time? Yes, I am actually an RN. Um, my background is emergency and I actually changed and I'm now in the recovery room. Um, I did that actually right at the tail end of my pregnancy, which I'm very grateful for. So switching 
years and not being in that high stress situation was very helpful and obviously has been helpful during the pandemic. Um, but being immersed in it though, I mean, even though I'm in recovery room, you know, it's still very present in our lives. So trying to stay on top of what's going on pandemic wise, managing family, uh, for yeah. me cutting back hours too was kind of helpful last summer. So great. Yeah. I really appreciate you joining us and sharing a little bit. I can imagine that you working and especially working in that field yeah. added just another element. Um, I know I personally work with lots of nurses, so lots of elements yeah. of like, what am I bringing home? How do I have to take all my clothes off and shower before I come in the house to see my babies? Yes. Um, I know for a lot of my moms, that was a really, um, a very large added stress. So that's yeah another piece to your story that you bring that I think is so important. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And they're at the age, my kiddos are obviously at the age where they cannot be vaccinated yet. So there's that whole, you know, layer. <laughs> added sure. Layer. Yeah. It's, I'm so glad that you came and that you shared. Thank you so much for hanging out with us today. I'm sure we'll have some more to talk about as we continue. Thank you for um, all. Yeah. Um, Mariah, do you want to tell us a little bit about yourself? All right. Hi, I am Mariah. Um, I am from um, Kalamazoo area. I um, have a 13 month old now, little girl, and I am, um, gosh, 25 weeks pregnant. Um, so kind of um, doing both sides here in the pandemic, giving birth and then also choosing to get pregnant again. <laughs> um, so it was, it has been a, an up and down journey. Um, when obviously when I was when I was pregnant with my first Mila um, was before the pandemic hit, so it was very um, it was a very traumatic process to go through all of the um, shutdowns and not knowing and rules changing. Um, I had Mila April 9th, so it was you know right when things were shutting down and um, no visitors at the hospital and. Um, you know, we didn't know what, who could come over after we got home. And so I um, suffered through a lot of guilt of um, decisions that I felt like we had to make to, you know, limit family coming over and um, people visiting. And um, Myla is the first grandchild on both sides of the family. So there was just a lot of, a lot of postpartum guilt um, on top of then, um, depression. And at first I blamed it on the pandemic and I thought, you know, it was just um, the situation we were in, but um, it did not get better. So finally, when Milo was about four months old, I started um, reaching out for help and doing our local support group and going to therapy. Um, I do also work full time at Bronson Hospital. Um, I am in the medical records department, so I'm not, you know, clinical, but I have... Um, then had to fight back and forth of working from home, working in the office, um, choosing daycare for Myla, and, and just always, you know, fearing that risk. And then the exposures come, and, you know, daycare shuts down or exposure at work. So um, it, it has been a lot. It was um, a hard choice for me of whether or not we did want to get pregnant again and go through it all again in a pandemic, but um, here we are you know, over a year later and it's not going away. So I felt like we just um, needed to keep living life. And if I could do it once, I could do it again. So that is, that is a pretty, <laughs> that is a brave thing. Absolutely. You survived the hardest parts of having a baby. You did all the things. Um, you know, I think one of the things that we talk a lot about in the group that I work with is setting boundaries as a mom is really tough. And so you had to do it in even a very different way about visitors and unknowns. I think unknowns are so anxiety provoking. Um, and you had to really kind of step out and set boundaries with your family about things that you didn't even know and make the best decisions you could. How was that for you? It was extraordinarily challenging. Um, not only did we not know, but um, things changed nonstop, you know, guidance changed and you, so you didn't know what to believe and um, so nobody met Myla for the first month. 
Um, they came and did a window visit, which um, is so traumatic to me still to this day that yeah. our parents met her through the window. <laughs> um, and so it was just, you just feel so guilty because not everyone made those same decisions that you did. Yeah. It sounds like you worked really hard to keep your family safe and your baby safe and even the grandparents safe because coming home from the hospital, there was a lot of uncertainty about what you might bring in the same way that Amanda had it as an employee, you know, just as someone who'd been inpatient. I, I so appreciate you joining us and sharing this story. It's a story that resonates with lots of people, lots of families that gave birth during this time. There were a lot of things to grieve. And that window visit is probably one that you're working your way through. Slowly, but surely. <laughs> yep. I, one of my favorite things is find your feet now. I love to say that to myself and to my women. And that's what you did then. You just found where you were and you did the best you could with what you had, you know? I think, um, I think Sasha can resonate a little bit too with Mariah's story um, as she also delivered during the first parts of the pandemic. So we'll slide on over to Sasha and maybe she can tell us a little bit about herself. Hello, uh, my name is Sasha. I am a stay at home mom to three girls. I have an 11 year old who has been doing virtual school for the past year. I have a two and a half year old who has now potty trained, <laughs> hallelujah. <laughs> and um, my one year old right here, this is little Luna. She was born April 21st. So, um, you know, when my, my first, my oldest was born, I went through pretty, pretty severe postpartum depression. It was, was so bad. I was having suicidal thoughts. I had no support, no, you know, my husband was working third shift. So he was working, working all night, sleeping all day. I lived in the middle of nowhere. I couldn't see family and friends. I didn't have a driver's license. It was really bad. When my second was born, I found the group Shades of Mother Motherhood, and it and it helped me cope with a lot of those traumas. And then Miss Luna here, um, obviously when I became pregnant for her, I didn't know we were going to go through a um, pandemic, but here we are. I I survived postpartum. Um, a lot of what Kirsten has said about learning to set boundaries. That's, that's the, the big thing that I have, have learned this last year, um, which has been very challenging. And um, the other thing that's helped me cope is learning about self-care. So I've, I've just been all about it, taking care of myself so that I can take care of my, my family and my kids. Yay. Yay. Luna's clapping. <laughs> Real clap for her too. Thank you so much, Sasha, for Say joining hi. us. And you certainly hi. have been through it too. Um, can you comment at all about some of the things that you have done? I think that that's a really hard topic for parents during the pandemic. How do we find self-care? What are yeah. some things that you might've used or tried? Um, well, I, before the pandemic, I've been um, all about keeping my house clean and, and, you know, keeping it doing my laundry and all that and I just kind of learned to just let it go I'm like the laundry will be there tomorrow you know I deserve a bubble bath <laughs> yeah so sometimes kind of making those adjustments for ourselves too right where we just say like this is not going to be the thing that makes a difference in my day but that bubble bath sure is yeah uh, yep. this one had a hard time sleeping the first year she She's just now learned at a year old how to sleep through the night. So um, we had a lot of challenges with with getting the appropriate amount of sleep. And so I just, I learned to take my naps when I could, even if it was just a five minute power nap on the couch while the, the children watch TV, you know, yeah. <laughs> here, turn on some TV. Let's mommy take a rest. <laughs> Absolutely. I think starting to to kind of take that guilt piece that I hear lots of moms talk about. I heard Mariah mention it and really try to, you know, work through some of the things about this is not how I wanted this to be, but right. this is how this works. And for all three of you, 
not having maybe supports that could come and relieve you so that you could get that rest or that nap or, Mm -hmm. you know, help clean your house or whatever. If, if you didn't have those supports, sometimes you had to use things that you wouldn't normally choose. Yeah. Yep. I don't know. So do we find Melissa or Chelsea? Are they with us? I lost my fancy background. It says that there is a, for me, which Melissa are you looking for? I, Melissa, we've got Melissa Ball and Chelsea Wooten. I'm looking at, (laughs) am I missing? Is that you, Melissa? I hear you. Yes, it is. I'm here. I can see you. I don't know if you can see me. I can't see you, but I can hear you. I'm glad you're here. Me too. Um, Tell us a little bit about yourself and your family. There you are. Yeah, I'm here. (laughs) Um, so I'm Melissa. Um, I'm feeling a little emotional right now, so bear with me. This is always a hard time of, of year for me. Um, I have one son, Jackson. He's going to be three years old in 11 days, which is hitting me with a lot of emotions for a lot of reasons. Um, but I've also dealt with kind of what I would almost call PTSD related to his birth. I had a very traumatic birth with him. Um, The long and short of it was Jackson was an IVF miracle baby. And I had so expected that I was going to get, you know, my wish coming true, finally having a baby and nothing went the way I thought it was going to be. I was depressed. I was anxious. I was scared. And his birth was, Um, a medically necessary c-section for me which was very upsetting because I wanted you know my body to be able to do the one thing it was supposed to do and it couldn't Um, and when I was in the hospital recovering with him struggling to breastfeed um, one of the mother baby nurses essentially called me a drug addict um, and told me that he would not be able to nurse because I took Zoloft for my depression and anxiety and I should just give up and give in. And from there, it was like the high of having a brand new baby right into the dump, right into the dumpster. You know, it's, and that's the reaction I got from everybody. Oh my gosh, you got your miracle. It's, you, you must be thrilled. You must be so excited. Everything is so wonderful. But I can't recall a single time when anybody actually sat down with me and said, are you okay? You know, other than, oh, how's your scar? Are, are you sleeping? I wasn't sleeping. I was miserable. I was constantly crying. And when I look back on it, I feel like I was screaming at the top of my lungs for help and nobody was listening, you know, because there's that, again, the facade of, oh, you were infertile. You got a baby now. You have absolutely nothing to be upset about. And it was... 38 days after he was born that I finally had a complete breakdown and called my doctor and said, I can't, I can't, something is wrong with me. Um, and shortly after that, I, I found shades, which they kept me alive. They still keep me alive. They're, they're more family than anything right now. So, um, and yeah, I'm trying to navigate, uh, you know, we'd like to have another baby. We'd have to do IVF, but we're in the middle of a pandemic and I don't feel comfortable going through medical treatments and all these things when I don't know how safe it's going to be. So, and I think what Kirsten said that resonates with me so much right now is grief. Mm -hmm. All of everything over the past year, over PMD itself it's I have so much grief I'm grieving for the pregnancy I wanted the birth I wanted the experience I wanted you know nothing went the way it was supposed to and then you know when I felt like I was starting to crawl out of that hole here's pandemic you know stay at home for the next year and try and keep yourself from going crazy so it's it's been a lot. I, I've always been of the belief, like it's the postpartum, it, it doesn't stop at two years old or, you know, whatever the marker is. It's like, it's still factors itself into everything. So 
I just kind of rambled there. So so I so appreciate you. No, we appreciate you sharing your story. And um, Melissa is one of our rock star moms. When she referred to Shades, that's the name of our our local group here in the capital area. Um, What I hear all these women mentioning is the importance of support. And that was a really hard thing to come by over this last year, virtually. I'm so grateful that it was an option for so many and that so many found that option. Um, Melissa hits on a couple really important points that I know have, have been issues for lots of families. And that's a lot of our IVF families, a lot of our fertility families, they're their path looked very different during this time or the considerations to continue their path looks very different. There is a lot of grief around that journey as well. So I I really appreciate you sharing that. I know it's very vulnerable. Um, And then the other thing that you mentioned is kind of like, once you get your head up for air, you know, you're ready to get out, you're ready to see people, you're ready to do things. And then it's like, nope, sorry. Yeah. There will be no things. And also 18 months, 18 months is a really tricky time, right? We all have these kids who are getting into all these things and now you're at home all the time with these really inquisitive kids. So, um, I really appreciate all of you sharing. I, and I appreciate all of the parts of your story that I think speak to other people. Um, I'm not sure. Is Chelsea here? Yes, she is. There she is. is. Yeah. He's here. Yeah. Hey, Chelsea, are you here? There you are. This is another exciting moment. I have not seen Chelsea in such a long time. She has such an important story to share with us, too. Yeah, so I actually have a to uh, So he's got to say hi. He's going to make it difficult. He was saying. I moved to Lansing two years ago, and I might have to actually go into the other bedroom. Okay, do what you need to do. If it's not working right now, we have a little bit of time for sure, so you could always pop back in if you need to. It's okay. I've learned um, that he just kind of has to cry some things out. He's learning that he can't play with my phone all the time. Ah, that's Um, a tough one. I'm Chelsea, and I moved to Lansing two years ago. And I actually met Melissa at a breastfeeding support group, and she invited me to Shades, and my life was changed. (laughs) I needed somewhere, after moving five hours away from all of my support, I needed somewhere to cry, and I needed friends, and I needed support, and I needed my son to make friends, and that was the perfect place because everybody was just so welcoming. And um, about five months after I had my son, September 15th, 2019, I was diagnosed with ALL. And I've been currently going through chemo treatments as long as uh, the pandemic's been going on. I actually was released from the hospital and a week later we were put under lockdown. (laughs) Kind of still gets to me. because I was on lockdown before lockdown happened. And uh, it's just really been tough for me to get out and to be safe. And I still just try to get out as much as I can. (laughs) Me and my son, we go out and go to like petting zoos or, you know, just anything that's socially distanced that we can appreciate. But for now, You know, I've just been reaching out for support in any way that I can. I found a therapist through Shades. I've actually, this is the first year um, I started antidepressants. I have been uh, depressed since high school, always um, suicidal, actually put on suicidal watch list. (laughs) And uh, I think this cancer treatment was the first time I ever came out of that and felt like I had a reason to live, just kind of raising my son, being a stay-at-home mom. It's really been (laughs) such a blessing um, in disguise. I mean, it's been stressful and we have our times (laughs) where I have to walk away. I have to close the door, but we we just currently um, became homeless. We are staying in a shelter. 
I have been homeless for about 20 days now, and we are hopeful that we're going to find the place of our dreams. Um, I've had plenty of, you know, fish biting at the hook, so hopefully something comes out and there's a miracle, I'm really hoping. Uh, but for now, we're safe in the shelter and we have a ton of support and we really couldn't ask for more. <laughs> we have a roof over our heads and we don't fight as much as we did in the old house. So I think things are turning peaceful and pandemic really brought out a side of my ex that was not great and he didn't reach out for help and I think that's really where the issue lies and I think if more people were to explain their stories and reach out and ask for help I think we'd all be better off <laughs> I think you hit you got that one right there Chelsea that's why I'm so grateful that you are all sharing thank you so much for sharing all the parts of your story there's lots of hard stuff there how how do you think you've stayed so positive with all the things that have been thrown at you or how do you think you've stayed resilient um, I've been very positive with him being around. Um, I I actually was filling out custody paperwork and it said, you know, how many overnights do you get? And I said three sixty five. <laughs> you know, I don't I don't get a day off, but that's okay because that smile keeps me going. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, and he's just now getting to the point where he'll come up and kiss me, hug me. Yeah, and he knows I'm upset. So just having that support has been great. I know it's not a lot, but <laughs> your smiles yeah. are absolutely gorgeous. They are so healthy and happy, and I know our community has really been pulling for that. Um, but you certainly have been through a lot of things, pandemic being one and lots of other ones layered on top of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. Yeah. And I think it's, uh, I think what keeps me going is honestly my friends and the, just the support I get through the community, not only through shades, but there's a lot of, uh, different people like, um, willow tree and I would say the Fledge and just a lot of other groups. I think moving to Lansing, I really have more resources than I would have had in my hometown. Um, my hometown was just really small. Uh, just for instance, like uh, car seat safety, that is not a thing where I'm from. So uh, moving here, it really opened my eyes and I can now tell my friends back at home, you know, hey, <laughs> loosen up that belt or tighten that up. Or, you know, just little things like that have been a big source of my smile, <laughs> I guess, okay. education wise. So I hear you say the importance of reaching out. And I think that was such a important thing that you said, because during the pandemic, we're all in our homes. We're all trying to keep our babies safe and our kids safe. What they need to do. We're all trying to function in the way that we can, but there was a world still out there. It was just hard to remember or to feel. Um, so reaching out to community resources, reaching out to therapists, our doctors, our local support groups, the virtual resources. I hear that is something that was really positive for you. Yeah, I actually, I used to have a lot of issues reaching out and asking for help, but recently being a disabled homeless mother, single mother, I've had to resort to help. I mean, I, I rely on it. So I yeah. think uh, everybody deserves help. <laughs> so don't be ashamed if you have to ask for it. I think that's a wonderful message. I think you certainly showed how to make some lemonade, girl. You are doing it. And <laughs> the idea that everybody deserves help is such a great thing. So I really appreciate I get a lot that. of people who I get a lot of people who think, you know, I can't complain to you because I'm not going through something as rough as you. And that, that's that's load. <laughs> <Cool>. <laughs> I think that that's what we've learned during this time here. Um, I think, you know, that 
every single family has gone through their own story during this time. And we're all just getting a peek into what those stories look like. Um, and so everybody's story is valuable and important. Everybody has been through different layers of stress. Um, does any, do any of you want to comment further on things that worked well for you during the pandemic, what you found that helped you kind of walk through some of these issues or anything at all that you want to share? If anything, I, I, I feel like in, in some respects, moms have gotten a little bit more respect since the pandemic. You know, we got so much before, oh, your moms, you love being with your kids. You love staying at home. Everything is just easy for you because you're staying at home and baking cookies and watching Snoopy or something. And then, you know, the rest of society had to come home and stay with our kids all the time. And now we're getting so much more of the, oh my God, how do you do this? How do you survive each day? And I think if nothing else, maybe we've had the chance to change some perspective, you know, on those of us who stay at home with our kids and how hard it is, you know, functioning and parenting even without depression or anxiety or any of these things. So I'm hopeful that maybe there's going to be more of a conversation and more understanding because it's not just you know, you're sitting at home, you cannot possibly have anything to complain about. Well, like Chelsea said, we don't get nights off. Jackson's going to be three in 11 days, and I have never been away from him for more than a couple of hours. It's, it's, it's not, it's not that easy. And if, like I said, if nothing else, maybe some people are starting to realize that and wanting to help out a little more, provide support to moms and not just assume that because we're doing it, it's easy for us to do it. I think that's a really important point. Thank you, Melissa. I think we already know that PMADs are a perfect, you know, they come from a perfect storm, right? We're not sleeping. We're not taking care of ourselves. We might not have supports. We're isolated. Everything in our life has changed. And then do that in your home in complete isolation, especially, you know, some of our moms who had just delivered during this time. And then all of our, all of our moms and dads too, um, that were really experiencing this. So I really, I'm hopeful too, that there is a greater conversation about, um, what people's experiences like with this and what that toll really can look like. Yep. Anybody else? So, um, I feel like the pandemic definitely highlighted for me um, things that I was holding on to that I needed to learn to let go of, like, let the house go. It'll be there tomorrow. Um, obviously, we've all been stuck in home staring at all corners of our house. So that has been something that got better for me, honestly, during the pandemic. My house is a disaster, but um, just being able to prioritize and what are the things that are truly important right then because at the, in the beginning no one was in a rush to go anywhere or do anything so what really did you need to be doing right then and there so that was something also grocery delivery services are amazing <laughs> if you're able to do them especially when Meyer does their free uh grocery <laughs> due to plug there um but like little things, there's also been those types of things that have popped up, um, different delivery services, especially if they're waiving the fees, like that has been very helpful for us too. And I'm a very good online shopper now. <laughs> Absolutely. I think there were, we used to talk about in the early stages of our support group, we would be like, oh man, I wish you could just like be able to pull up to a store and get what you needed and not have to take your baby out of the car. So there are some little bits of things that I think were super helpful that came out of this. I see Mariah's unmuted. What would you like to share? Yeah, I was going to say, I think the, the biggest thing that helped me was um, our local support group and having um, moms around you that are going through the same thing because really no one can truly understand having a baby in a little pandemic unless you're doing it. Yep. <laughs> and um, so I think that was one of the biggest things that helped me. 
I think it's such a very, very good point. We talk a lot about, you know, treatment being that three-legged stool, you know, sometimes it's medication, sometimes it's therapy, and sometimes it's a support group, but really all three gives you that, you know, that firm footing. And I noticed in the chat here um, that there's some links to, there's tons of online support groups through PSI Michigan for even very specific things. If you have certain specific topics, there's a whole list. I love that Mariah, you found your group in Bronson. Um, I love, I love, love, love the women in my group. You know that I tell you guys all the time. Um, and we have in Michigan lots, I don't know what the number is, but we have lots of area support groups. So, um, really, oh, there are nine Michigan state coordinators. So I see that in the chat and you can reach out to any of them to find the most local resources. Most of the PSI resources have gone online. Um, I know our, our particular group went online within a week of this happening. And that was something that we were all very grateful for. Um, so there's lots of good supports out there. So I, I really appreciate Mariah that you highlighted that and the need for that. Um, and if you know people who are struggling, encourage them to reach out to PSI Michigan. There is someone who will be available to help. And 13 Michigan support groups. I wondered, that's a, that's a pretty good amount. Okay. Anything else that someone wants to share or questions that we might have? Kirsten, Christina. Christina. Yes, thank you. This is Christina. Um, I just, first of all, thank you all for sharing your stories. I love my mamas and support group so much. So Kirsten, I completely understand what you're saying. It's the highlight of my week. Um, but what I would like to know, and if you wouldn't mind sharing, um, moms, if, you know, for people that are listening or people that see this recording later, if you are a family member or if you are a friend and you notice that someone is struggling, what is some, what are some advice, some words of wisdom that you would give to a family or friend that they can do to help to, you know, be able to approach that mom and say, you know, what can I do for you? What are some words of wisdom that you'd have for us? Christina, I think that's a great question. Um, I think what, what initially came to my head was acknowledge because I feel like everyone knew um, or had a hunch, you know, that this was hard, that you're struggling, but no one acknowledged that um, this is hard and you're not okay. And what can we do to help? Instead, it was kind of just, um, not swept under the rug, but but kind of a blind eye to. Um, so I, I really think from family and friends to just to acknowledge and um, reach out that you may be struggling. I think that's such a wise thing, Mariah, just that word acknowledge. Anytime we connect and acknowledge, that is so meaningful. Thank you for sharing that. Anybody else? No, I was going to say to give give the mother attention before you give the baby attention instead of immediately, let me hold the baby. Mm -hmm. No, um, how are you doing, hun? You know, place your hand on your shoulder, give her some physical contact if you, if you can socially, you know, safely if you've been vaccinated, but um, you know, just reach out to the person and, and, you know, ask them how, how are you doing? How are you handling this? How are you coping? And you know, sometimes they'll open up and try to offer instead of saying, what can I do for you? Say, well, why don't I buy you a meal? Why don't I, why don't I, you know, help you clean up your living room a little bit? You know, I'll, I'll do a load of laundry for you. You know, just sometimes moms have a hard time asking for help. So sometimes they need it. They need it offered instead of asked for. It's piggybacking off what Sasha's saying right there. It's people are so willing to, you know, ask, oh, do you want me to do X or Y? And even when you're in the depths of that, as worse as it is, it is so hard to say, yeah, that would be, that would be amazing. Um, I can't remember where I saw the post, but there was this wonderful list of ways to respond to a new mom. Oh, I'm going to Meyer right now what's your favorite ice cream? I'll come and drop it off for you. Um, if you're comfortable, I'd love to stop by and do the dishes while you take a nap or take a shower. It's just like, don't, don't make it feel like they're, they're only offering because like, it's the socially acceptable thing to do. People will do these things for you, be, you know, because they love you, because they care about you. 
and approach it as, well, I'm going to do this for you anyway, because I'm here, you're not going to get rid of me. So, you know, let me, let me help you. And I, I still don't remember who said it to me, but somebody said once the way you ask them how they're doing is how are you inside yourself? Not how are your breasts? How are you sleeping? How's your scar? How's the baby? How are you inside yourself? And I thought that was a really poignant question. And I wish somebody had asked, you know, what's, what's going on in here right now? Mm -hmm. And I think the key is also to keep asking because it is obvious. I think when people are struggling and there's so much shame with, you know, there has to be something wrong with me. I'm not bonding with my baby. I don't have this hallmark moment of where I'm farting unicorns and rainbows because I just met my child. (laughs) It's not how it happens, you know? I just Um, wanted to say the same, uh, what Melissa was saying as well. I, I try with my recent friends and family that have had babies just to say, I am free this Wednesday afternoon and Friday afternoon. Which day do you want me to come over? Or what day can I um, bring you something? The best thing that somebody ever did to me when I had a baby, a newborn, was bring me a, left me a cooler worth of frozen burritos that they had made on my doorstep and just said, these are going to be easy for you to make one handed. I know you're breastfeeding. I know you're going to be starving you know, here's food for you. I'll give you more if you need it. And then they would, they came back a month later with a, like a bucket of soup or something. And it was awesome. And it's been something that I just now try to do as many times as I can for somebody else, because even just the simple things of like going to the bathroom and eating become intensely difficult. Um, And I also just make it a point to say to friends, family, and patients of mine, like, it's okay to not feel okay. And one of the best days I had as a provider was somebody coming back or talking to me at a later visit and saying, you're the first person that said it was okay to not feel good about being a mom. And it honestly like changed how I talk to people. Yeah, really, really good points. I also have, once I got through my own depression and I was feeling better on the other side of it, I had a really hard time reaching out to people. And that is something that I have now that I'm better um, trying to do, even if it's just a message. And then I'm setting up that expectation. I'm going to check on you next week, you know, just so that they know that someone's there, you know, even if they don't ask for anything or I'm not even able to do anything big, just knowing that they can message you is huge. Yeah. I think that is such a good thing to also talk about what it, you know, we talk about that 2020 hindsight when you can look back and you can say, this is what it was like for me in it. But now that I'm a little bit to the other side, here's what I can share and offer in a different way. Mm -hmm. Um, We talk a lot in our group about moms are sometimes the wrapper and the baby's the candy, and that doesn't feel so good. Um, and so reminding our moms that they are not the wrapper, that they are the candy as well. And I love the idea of the burritos and the food and the, is that our Bridget that said that? Oh, hello, Bridget. That's so exciting. I I didn't recognize that that was who you were. (laughs) Um, you know, I love the idea of really thinking about who the mom is and what she could really use. And so like, you know, as Sasha and many of you have said, like, here's, you know, here's a way to offer in a way that can be accepted. Kristen, I think that was such a um, great analogy The you know, moms are not a rapper because um, my, I think that was a big show in my postpartum. People wanted to help by coming over to just hold the baby. And yeah. um, but I, I wanted to hold my baby and relax, you know, and, and someone else helped me do the, do the housework. And, and it does just feel like you're the barrier in between the, yep. the baby and who wants to come see him. I really hope Mariah, that you will take that with you into this next pregnancy. You have that kind of hindsight knowledge too. And 
Um, I often tell my moms, I had a December 20th baby and he went to the NICU and he came home on Christmas Eve and, oh, did everybody just want to hold that baby and look at that baby? And I was like, wait a minute, I haven't held him for four days. I'm not serving anyone else coffee. I'm not getting anybody else something to eat. I would like to hold my baby and y'all can fend for yourself. Right. (laughs) Um, and, and so often people forget about that. So I'm really happy, Mariah, that you hopefully will take that with you into this next opportunity because you get to sit and hold your baby. You don't have to take care of anybody else. Yep. Y'all are pretty special rappers. I think that's what I think for sure. We've got a couple minutes left. Do we have other questions or other things that we want to say? I think we've highlighted a lot of important stuff here. Oh, I see Melissa. Do you want to share something? Uh, am I mute? Oh, no, I'm not mute. Um, I just wanted to say for myself when I have the opportunity to do so, I was a lawyer before all of this. And it has been the greatest part of my life to work with these moms, to advocate for people. And anytime I have those moments where I think to myself, you went through law school, you did all this, and then you decided to just give it up. Even looking back through everything I went through, I would give all of it up again any day of the week because this is so much more important. And I finally feel like I have found my place in life. So that meaning making is really, really big, right? Like, what do we do? You know, I said to Chelsea that she was making lemonade. I think you all have learned how to take what you've been through and pull really important things. And then you show up here today to share your stories. And we're so grateful. I think, Melissa, we should address the thing, though, because I saw a couple of people in the chat. Just so you know, we did go back to the hospital and offer them some education about Zoloft and about how we treat moms who take Zoloft. So I just want to make that clear. We did go back and, and touch base about that because I saw some horrified chat messages and, and we felt the same way. So again, if Melissa wouldn't have been brave enough to come to group and to call that out, we could have never known that that was happening. Um, your stories are brave. Your voices are brave. I appreciate all of you so, so much for joining us today. Anything else in our last couple minutes? I I hear lots of props here for you. Um, Go ahead, Chelsea. Sorry. uh, uh, I just wanted to say that I thought, um, you know, advocating for my health uh, would stop after birth. Um, But Shades has really... uh, helped me navigate through my chemotherapy uh, and all the mess I've had to deal with that. And, you know, along with trying to find childcare along with my son and everything. But the real uh, issue was, uh, you know, just having nobody around and feeling absolutely lonely and about to lose my mind because uh, I'm not sure if I'm going to wake up the next day. So uh, not having a doctor that was supportive enough really put a damper on my treatment in the first half, especially going through pandemic. But now um, Shades has really pushed me to set boundaries and find new healthcare providers and just find the person that's right for you because yeah, I, it took me a while, but that's all I have to say. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that. The importance of advocating for yourself and your care, um, not just in your time of birth and delivery, but also after is so important. Um, I think we could spend a whole day talking about women getting written off or this or that. Of course, you're tired. Of course, you're stressed. Of course, you're anxious. You're new parents, all the things, right? But if you are really feeling those things and no one is listening beyond just, oh yeah, that's what happens when you're a mom or when you're pregnant or um, that's not okay. And so I love that you shared that message, Chelsea. I think each and every woman deserves to be listened to and her story deserves to be heard and we deserve um, exactly the best care that we can get. 
And so that's a really important message. If you're not getting it, take a page out of Chelsea's book and give them the boot, right? I was say, I think Kirsten, you've, you've told us the story before, you know, like advocate for yourself the way you would advocate for your child or a friend, you know, yep. you're in a coffee shop and your friend says, oh, I'd really like something. You get up and you get it for your friend instead of, you know, them yep. just sitting by you, you get up and you do it for them. So do it for yourself, what you would do for others. Yep. We so often are willing to do stuff for our kiddos, right? We're so, we would do things for them that we would never dream of for ourselves. And then when I watch us do it for fellow mamas, right? Like we'll do something for them that, oh, we don't need it. No, you deserve it too. Yeah. Uh, wow. This has been great, Kirsten. I'd like to thank our panelists, Melissa and Amanda and Chelsea and Mariah and Sasha. I'm blown away, um, I'm sure. And I've been reading some of the chat too, where people are just so thankful to hear your story and your powerful women, you're resilient. You've got great support, but I say it's, it's, it's in here for you all to, to be surviving and getting through this and thinking about having another baby. So good for you all. Um, very, very glad to hear from you. Thank you. And Kirsten, thank you for your uh, facilitation of your great group of, of moms. Absolutely. Thanks, ladies. Thanks for sharing. Yeah, and I also liked how you included men. You know, we do know one in 10 men will have signs of um, PMAD. So again, we know, you know, sometimes it affects them differently, looks differently, but we have to remember that they're um, affected as well. So we're going to now turn it over to, um, you know, what are we going to do about this? And, you know, what is our call to action here? What are we going to do to address some of these concerns we've heard about, to how to strengthen the things that are working well for us? Uh, so I'm going to introduce to you a couple more of our PSI Michigan board members, Sarah Doyle and Amy Lawson. Welcome. Great, great. Can everybody hear me? Yep, great. Well, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sarah Doyle, and along with uh, Amy Lawson here uh, today as Michigan's uh, climb leaders to share about the climb out of darkness. Uh, the climb out of darkness is the world's largest event raising awareness of maternal mental health disorders such as postpartum depression, anxiety, OCD, and psychosis. As a part of the climb, survivors all over the world climb, hike, or walk together at local mountains, parks, or in our case, the Michigan Capitol Steps uh, to symbolize our collective rise out of the darkness. PSI is made up of people who know how it feels to wonder if you will survive, who know how it feels to think mistakenly that you are failing, who know how it feels to lose a loved one. We know how it is to get through the most challenging time and then to give back, to make sense and meaning of what you went through. Many of us began our parenting journey feeling broken, small, afraid, and embarrassed. And then we came through through time, hard work, and recovery to find healing, new strength, and connection with others. We are stronger and kinder to ourselves. We are inspired to become a beacon for the next person's recovery. Thank you for joining us today for Michigan's Capital Climb. Thank you for helping us light the way out of the darkness. We climb because we know how important it is to feel connected, supported, informed, and ready to help the next person who needs us. We climb because it saves lives. We climb because of you. Climbs are held on or around the longest day of the year to shine light on maternal mental health. In 2019, more than 2,500 participants joined climbs in 45 states and 11 countries around the world. In 2020, despite most teams being three or four months into the planning, the climb was taken online with all events and fundraising happening virtually. PSI was still able to raise nearly $80,000, most of which has been distributed to 22 community organizations, 25 state chapters, and directed towards scholarships for providers of color. If you wanna lead a climb or get involved in climb activities near you, please check out the PSI Michigan website. We also have climbs in Detroit, Ann Arbor, Grand Haven, Livonia, and Lansing. We hope that we can find climbers in every community in Michigan. Big thank you to Kayla and Emily and the Michigan Climb Committee who helped plan today's event. I think if Kayla is uh, here with us, she's gonna drop some information in our chat about her cards for a cause fundraiser. Also, if you'd like to donate today, we'll also made the link available in the chat. Funds raised will benefit local chapters and resources for here uh, in Michigan, which Amy will share more about. So with that, I will turn it over to Amy Lawson. Thank you, Sarah. Yeah. Uh, 
Thank you, everyone, for being here today. Um, I am the treasurer of PSI Michigan and also one of the climb leaders. Um, and I wanted to tell you a little bit about our fundraising and where that money is going. Um, so as Sarah's mentioned, the, the goal of the climb is to bring awareness to perinatal mood and anxiety disorders um, and what we're doing to address that throughout Michigan and also raising funds to help us better meet the needs of families who are going through um, some kind of perinatal mood and anxiety disorder. So as, a, as the state chapter board of PSI Michigan, um, as Nancy mentioned in the beginning, we're a very new uh, chapter. We've only been around for about a year. So we're just kind of getting our getting our on our feet. Um, but we really want to focus our efforts um, on increasing access to trained perinatal mental health providers throughout the state of Michigan. Uh, that can be a therapist, that can be a doula, that can be a midwife or another prescriber, a nurse practitioner, um, uh, any kind of health care provider that works with new families. Um, and so the way that we have um, decided to try to increase access is to provide scholarships for providers who may not be trained in uh, perinatal mental health um, and anxiety disorders to attend um, postpartum support international trainings so that they can learn more um, and be available in their communities to provide those services to families. Um, I think we just heard in our um, panel of moms that sometimes even though a provider may be an OBGYN or maybe a nurse, they don't always, they're not always an expert on um, perinatal mood and anxiety disorders. Um, and unfortunately, we know all too well that many moms um, encounter treatment that is actually contrary to our uh, evidence-based uh, knowledge about how to best treat perinatal mood and anxiety disorders. And if you're already <clears throat> someone who's struggling with depression or anxiety, um, having a provider who is giving you information that may not be correct is not going to help you. Um, so we want to make sure that everyone who is able to get care from somebody who is trained um, and who knows what they're talking about um, and is not giving misleading information. Um, so last year, we were able to provide about $1,000 worth of scholarships um, to Michigan healthcare professionals that allowed them to attend trainings. Um, and this year, our goal is to double or triple that amount if possible. So if you are able to give any money to donate anything, um, that is where your money is going to go. We are an all volunteer organization. Um, the money is not going to us, it's going to go to our, towards our scholarship fund. Um, we're particularly interested in, in, um, in adding trained providers to underserved communities. So we've heard in this a wonderful um, day so far about culturally congruent care and how it can be really helpful to have a provider that looks like you or has had some of the same life experience as you. Um, and we know that, you know, historically, um, we're not necessarily well, as well represented among, among communities of color um, and other um, communities without, throughout the state. So we're particularly looking to add to providers from diverse racial and ethnic backgrounds including people of color and indigenous Americans. Um, we're also intent on increasing the number of PMAD trained providers in the more rural parts of Michigan. So another thing about Michigan, um, I think some of the Lansing mamas talked about how in Lansing, it's great because you have, you have better access to care. But in some of our more rural parts of Michigan, it's not so easy to access good care. Um, so we really want to increase the number of providers in rural areas who are able to give that kind of competent perimetal mood and anxiety um, care to new families. Um, if you're a provider and you would like to become um, more culturally competent or more competent in PMAD um, provision, we also encourage you to apply for our scholarships. Um, we will have information on that, I think, in the chat and how to apply, or you can go to our chapter website and there's a uh, form there. Um, and we can link you to lots of training opportunities. So if, if, if you live in an area where there aren't a lot of providers and you, you know, would like there to be, let us know and let us know who we can reach out to. Um, what healthcare systems or people can we reach out to in that area? Um, so that's our, our basic fundraising goal. Um, I just also wanted to mention a couple things about some of the services we do have in Michigan through Postpartum Support International. Um, so I believe 
earlier, um, a little bit earlier, Nancy put some resources in the chat uh, box for us that are postpartum support international resources. So we've got, um, there's a helpline. I know that Nancy put the number in there um, for both English and Spanish speakers. Um, you can call or text the helpline. That's for anyone who might just need to chat. It's not an emergency crisis line. Um, it's a warm line, but you can call and chat with someone um, there. Um, if you're wanting to just kind of can make a connection and maybe get some resources. Most, um, in most cases, if you talk to a helpline volunteer, they will refer you to um, a local support coordinator that is in your state. Um, and as Nancy mentioned earlier, we have about 10 support coordinators throughout the state of Michigan. We've just added one in Northern Michigan in the last week or so, two weeks. Um, so we have about 10 support coordinators that are spread throughout the state. Um, and these are all volunteers. Um, I happen to be one of them. Um, we, uh, so as coordinators, we provide people who are looking for resources with a link to that resource. So if you're looking for a therapist, if you're looking for somebody who can prescribe medication, if you're looking for lactation support, if you're looking for a doula, um, we can help to connect you with local resources. We kind of try to keep up to date on the resources in our area. Um, so you can, again, access your that support coordinator by going through the helpline. You can also go on the PSI website and under the Get Help tab, um, there's a link to PSI coordinators and finding your support coordinator there. Um, and then the last thing I just wanted to uh, let you know about is the PSI per directory of providers. This is a relatively recent, it's a little, <clears throat> a little over a year, maybe two years old now. Um, but this, this directory, which we will have the link to in the chat, is a directory of um, providers that's vetted by Postpartum Support International. Um, so in unlike some other provider directories where somebody might just check a box to say, oh yeah, I work with pregnant and parenting people. Um, to get onto the PSI provider website uh, directory, you have to have shown that you've actually gone through trainings and are educated um, about <clears throat> PMEDs. Um, so you can go on the directory yourself if you want to. Um, you can search by location, by name, by specialty, and find a provider in your area. And you can also further filter by things like insurance type or sliding scale. Um, or items like that. So those are just some of the services that we have through Postpartum Support International and through our local Michigan State chapter. Um, and again, if you have, if you are able to donate to us, we would love it. If you would like to become involved, reach out in another way, um, reach out and we'd be glad to talk to you. Wow, that is excellent. There's so much that's done with the dollars that are raised to help women across our state of Michigan uh, and fathers. I mean, we do have a, a piece there too. I just think it's wonderful what we have and encourage you to catch on to those links that have been put into the chat uh, for that further, further connections. So thank you both, Sarah and Amy. Um, it does take a committed group of people to pull off something like this uh, that we've done. And so I would like just to make a few shout outs of thanks to folks that have um, kind of been working behind the scenes. Uh, one of them is um, Danielle Gordon, who's been our tech person today. We haven't really seen her, but uh, she's been helping us with the Facebook connection and Zoom and PowerPoints and all that. So thank you very much, Danielle. And then I also like to recognize uh, Sarah Doyle for your leadership in this campaign for the Capitol Walk uh, Climb, excuse me, it's the climb, and all the leadership you've given us to, to make this uh, a successful day. And then um, lastly, I'd just like to thank all of our board members who have um, joined us today and encourage you all to um, spread the word, keep the word going uh, for moms and for families. So we're... Um, time to walk. It's time to walk. And on behalf of the Michigan PSI board, I invite you to take a walk around the block. Maybe you want to walk some of your stairs. Uh, maybe get on the trampoline and jump on the trampoline if you have that. But just get out, take in the sun, take in the fresh air, and think about what we've learned today from all of us that have um, shared our stories. And take that walk and see if there's more we can do to help moms and families and babies. Uh, be sure to take a picture of yourself during the climb too and post it to our Facebook page. We'd love to see the various folks out climbing uh, in support of maternal mental health. 
So to help motivate you, we would like to, uh, again, show you the PSI mom video that was created during COVID times. And uh, as we finish out this, just again, thank you for being here. And we encourage you to get out there and walk, climb. <laughs> Thank you.